we've been talking about all morning, it is Back to Church Sunday, and so we're excited again as we gather together as thousands of churches around the nation that take this third Sunday of September to celebrate Back to Church Sunday. It's just a way for us to, as we get back into the fall and into the school routine, to be able to really intentionally say, this is a Sunday we set aside to invite our family and our friends. Not that every week we hope you're not inviting people, but intentionally really inviting people to come and join together. And so today we're going to be simply looking at a message called Rooted in Faith. Rooted in Faith. And some of you, maybe you hear that phrase, rooted in faith, and maybe there's things that already began to come to your mind, or maybe there's certain stories in Scripture that come to your mind. And today we're going to be looking at one that's relatively familiar with a lot of people in John chapter 15, as Jesus talks about being the vine and the branches, but that's not actually where we're going to start. We're going to start a little bit further into the New Testament in the book of Colossians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul is teaching on what it means or, or what encouraging us to be rooted in our faith and what that looks like for us as believers. And I want to just kind of start you with this summary of what today's message is going to be about. So this is kind of giving it to you in a nutshell before we expand upon it this morning. Historically, God has used people who are deeply rooted in their faith to make a difference in the world. The church is meant to be a blessing to the world when it's devoted to the truth of God's word and dedicated to living it out. The fruit of our lives can be directly correlated to the roots of our lives. On what do we build our lives? A life built on Jesus overflows with purpose and meaning. When we allow the Holy Spirit to empower, equip, and enable us to do what he's calling us to do, the Bible compares this kind of connection to the vine that has many branches. The vine produces the nourishment and the power for the branches to produce powerful things. The same is true with us. When we are connected to the vine, we are connected to Christ. We experience the full life through the working of the Holy Spirit to see the gospel message continue to move forward. So again, just excited for what God has as we look into his word together this morning. If you're a guest again, I just want to say welcome and joining us online. Thank you for being with us today. When Pastor Laura and I moved here over six years ago, we bought a house in Hibbing and we were excited. It was our first house we'd ever purchased. And there were a lot of things we started to do right away. We started to update a lot of things inside the house, a lot of it cosmetic, painting walls, changing fixtures, doing different things of that nature. But surprisingly, one of my least favorite, which I didn't necessarily expect it to be, one of my least favorite parts of owning a home was actually some of what I had to do outside as far as the yard work type. And I'm not talking about mowing the lawn and that type of stuff, but there were certain things we wanted to, to take care of in our yard that were not there that we wanted to add into our yard. And so we have a fenced-in backyard, but we also, for some of you, you know we live right on Howard Street and so our alley behind our house is very busy as well with a lot of traffic that comes by in our alley and so with having a fenced in backyard but it was just an open uh, fence we wanted to put something up there that would give us a little bit of privacy so when people came by our house they couldn't just see into the backyard if they came through the alley and so our neighbors had these wonderful vines that they had grown over their fence line and we said, ah, that's a good idea. We'd like to do something like that. And so we went to a, a nursery, a greenhouse, and they gave us some directions, some ideas of some different possible vines that we could buy that would eventually grow and, and give us some cover on our fences that we have in our backyard that would block off the back alley. But how many of you know when it comes to planting a vine or a tree or whatever it may be, there's a little bit more work than what you first think when you're like, oh, I'll plant a tree, or I'll plant a vine, or I'll plant a bush, whatever it may be. You're like, how hard could it be? And then you start to look at it, and you look at the root system of it, and you realize how big a hole you're going to have to make in order to fit this root system into the ground in order to help this tree, this vine, this bush, whatever it is, have an opportunity to grow and for its roots to grab root and to continue to grow and develop, right? You can't cut corners. 
You can't dig it too small or too little, or the roots will not be able to last. Who knows? What's the most important part of any tree, any bush, any flower, any vine? The roots, right? The roots are the very most important part of any plant or tree or vine or bush. They're vital to its health. They help it to withstand the wind and the rain, the physical elements. That means the roots must be able to go deep. The roots must be able to, to absorb the great amounts of nutrients from the ground, from the soil that is needed. So not only do they grow deep, they often grow wide to cover ground. Any thriving vine, plant, or tree will have an unseen root system that is vast and widespread as the vines and branches that we see above the ground. There's equally often as big of an underground root system as there often is above ground. Why do I share that with you? Well, because as I mentioned, Scripture is full of examples of times where not only does Jesus, but some of the other uh, individuals in the Bible talk about the importance of roots or the importance of planting ourselves in God's Word firmly. The Bible suggests that we need the same type of deep roots in God. We need to have the same spiritual roots in our life, in His Word, to flourish, to be healthy, to be strong, to be able to produce fruit that others can see and taste and enjoy. God wants us to pay close attention to the roots that we develop in our lives. They help us stand strong in the face of difficulties and trials that come our way in life. They help us to grow into mature and healthy believers. Roots help us to have a firm foundation in a world of chaos. Is there chaos in this world? Just a little bit, right? Every once in a while, somebody on the news tells us something's going on. There's a little bit of chaos. What helps us when we're anchored, when we're rooted in God, in His Word, in His Holy Spirit? It brings me to our first point this morning. Faith in Jesus grows deep roots. Faith in Jesus grows deep roots. And as I said, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles or your phone and your Bible app in a moment, we're going to read from chapter 2. But the Apostle Paul wrote a letter a long time ago to the church in Colossae. His letter was an encouragement to them in this newfound faith they had in Jesus Christ. They were facing pressure to abandon their convictions. They were being persecuted because of their faith and trust they had put into Jesus as their Messiah, as their Lord. And this is Paul's appeal for them. His appeal was for them to focus on their roots of faith in order that they would continue to stand strong in light of the persecution and pressure they were feeling. So Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. Rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. What did Paul start with in this passage? He starts with this understanding, this crucial assumption about the readers that he is writing this letter to, this church that he is writing this letter to. He was writing it to those who had what? Who had made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. That's the audience, or that's the assumption of who he is writing this letter to. I'm not naive enough to assume that every person that is here this morning and every person that is joining us online or will watch online has a relationship with the Lord at this point in time. And that's okay. We are so glad you're here with us today. We're so glad you're joining us online because this morning you're going to hear about Jesus as our Messiah. To make Jesus our Lord simply means that we follow his teachings, that we allow him to reign in our lives day in and day out, that we believe that he died, that he rose again, and that he has forgiven us for our sins, and we repent of our sin and we turn to him. His teachings, as we follow them, it changes the way we carry ourselves, it changes our actions, it changes how we treat our spouse, how we treat our family, how we treat friends, co-workers, and the list goes on and on and on. We are no longer controlled by our emotions or our feelings. 
The way that we carry ourselves is by listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit and His guiding and directing in our lives. How we spend our free time is no longer subject to just what you and I choose to do, but it's determined again by what the Holy Spirit is leading and prompting us to do as we follow His example. Paul believed accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior was the most important decision anyone could make. How many of you agree? The most important decision we could ever make is a personal commitment to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. I had the opportunity this morning to receive a prayer request card from a young boy who said, I want to pray that Jesus would forgive me of my sins this morning. That's why we do this. That's why we gather together. Because of moments like that. There is nothing greater than people coming to a place of understanding the most important thing in their life is a personal relationship with Jesus, understanding He is their Messiah. And you know, I looked at him and I said, I'm so proud of you, I'm so excited for you. And I said, do you know this? I said, do you know that it says in God's Word that right now, heaven is throwing a party for you because you made a decision to give your heart to the Lord? You. You are responsible right now for a party that is taking place in heaven. That is what God's Word tells us. Hallelujah. That's what Paul is teaching. Accepting Jesus is the most important decision we can make. It's the centerpiece of, 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 of the New Testament theology and writing because it's the key to living a full life in Christ. Making Jesus your Lord is a decision that you make with your heart and it plays out in every other aspect of your life moving forward. Faith is a proper response to the awareness of the sin we have, that we've made mistakes in our life, that we are broken, but there is someone who came to forgive us of our sins. There's someone who came who can cover all of our mistakes. And there's someone who can mend the brokenness and restore us back to health once again. And that's Jesus Christ. I believe in doctors and physicians. I believe that as I go to them that I trust that they are making wise and good choices to help me with the different things that I may be needing help with at a given time. For some of you know, I, I'm, I'm coming out of having a case of the shingles, and the, the doctor, the nurse, the, the individuals that I dealt with did a great job helping me get through this bout. They got me the treatment that I needed, and I'm feeling much, much better. Right? I believe that God works through medicine, that God physicians and allow doctors and science to advance to a place where God works through that avenue to bring healing and to cure us. I believe that if I were to have some legal concerns, that I would find a lawyer that I could trust that would help me, that would be able to defend me or, or, or stand up for me or whatever it would be with whatever the situation may be. Right? It's no different when we go to our banker to make a deposit, which maybe for some of you any, any more mobile banking, you've never stepped into a bank. But right? We think about when you went to the bank and you handed that banker your money, you trusted that the amount of money you gave her to deposit, she placed into your account. You trusted them to do their job, to keep their hands off of it, and put it all where it belonged. I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I put my life in His hands, and I trust Him to do what I am incapable of doing myself. I am not capable of forgiving myself of my sins. I am not capable for mending myself of my brokenness. I am not capable of doing that. I cannot save myself from sin. Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead offers grace, it offers forgiveness, and there's power when we receive faith in Jesus. Paul instructed the people in the early church of Colossae, to double down on their decision to love Jesus and to submit to his leadership in their lives. He says, I know you're being persecuted. I know you're being pressured. I know people are trying to get you to give up on your faith. He says, don't just, you know, stand up. He doubles down. He says, I want you to continue to do what I'm calling you to do. 
Their faith in him had given them deep roots that strengthened them to the things that they were now facing at this point in time. The same is true for you and I today. As we spend time in God's word, as we spend time in prayer, as we spend time allowing the Holy Spirit to minister and change us and transform us and renew our minds, in those moments, that is us allowing God to help our roots to grow deeper and to grow wider and to grow stronger roots in our faith so that when we face the different challenges that come our way, we can stand firm. We can stand strong and we can continue to live out our faith that God may be glorified in and through it. Faith in Jesus develops deep roots of hope, of purpose, of confidence, of freedom, and of joy. Jesus helps us grow deep roots. Our second point we're going to look at is where these deep roots can grow most effectively. Where is that? Number two. Roots of faith grow in fellowship, or grow in community, we could say, as well. Our roots of faith grow in our fellowship within the body of Christ, within the community of Christ, within the family of God, is where our roots of faith grow. The most beautiful things happen when the fellowship of believers gather together regularly to see their faith in God play out day in and day out. It's in this relationship that our roots grow deep because of the investment and encouragement that comes from being a part of a church, from being a part of fellowship and community in the body of Christ. The writer of the book of Hebrews knew this importance of people gathering together and the power that came when the people of God gathered together. He encourages listeners to not grow weary of getting together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Continue to remain in fellowship, to remain in community with the body of Christ. May we not give up, despite what pressures we may feel, despite what culture may be trying to tell us, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And again, it says, and all the more as we see the day approaching. We don't know the day that he will return, but we do know this, every day is one day closer. And there is an urgency that we don't know. Not only do we not know when the Lord is going to send Jesus back, we don't know when our last day is, where God is going to call us to be gathered home with him. And so may we continue to spur one another on toward love and good deeds, meeting together and encouraging one another. Again, these verses, they encourage us not to forget about having faith in Jesus, but yet that we would continue to encourage and prod one another on in our faith in Jesus. And that as we do so, that there will be good deeds, there will be fruit that will come out of it that will bless the world around us. Spur one another on. The Greek word that they translated into this spur one another is a phrase that actually means to stimulate or to irritate with jabs or cuts so that someone must respond. Right? It's kind of a weird little uh, explanation or definition, but it's, they're using this strong language to communicate how truly vital this community is, how truly vital fellowship is in our faith, that we need to be persistent in it, that we need to continue to push and encourage one another. When we look one another in the eye and we spend time listening to the stories of what is going on in people's lives, and we hear about what God is doing, it's contagious. It builds faith within us. It encourages us that despite maybe the challenges we're going through, we know that God is moving in powerful ways in each and every person's lives. The author of Hebrews views gathering together as believers as a catalyst for seeing good works and life change taking place. The church has been a force for good all throughout its history. The people of God have gathered together for centuries in order to impact their community and the world around them. 
In 369 AD, the church built the first ever hospital to help the sick and the hurting, and it's still one of the largest providers of health care in the world. The church was the first to stand up for the rights of children and created the first and largest orphanage system in the whole world. Did you know that 100 of the first 110 universities in America were founded as Christian institutions providing higher education? Much of the world's arts, literature, architecture, and music have been shaped by the people of God in connection with one another in fellowship and community. This is not just ancient history. This is actively present and happening today. Today, the church and Christian ministries impact every corner of the globe, providing food and water and assistance whenever there's a call for help. When disaster hits, the church is there. Jesus said his followers would be the hope of the world, and in this church, our heart is to strive to help our community here in Chisholm and invest in seeing God continue to be glorified to help to meet the needs of those around us. That's why we share about things such as the Project Free Care Clinic, because it's a need that is present here. How do we partner with them? We help them. We financially support them. We come alongside them. We make people aware of not only the opportunity people can receive help, but just the fact that that is even an option. I think a lot of us are not even aware of a lot of the different services that are even available across this area to help people. Here's a story I recently came across, and I think it helps to point out what I'm trying to share with you in this concept of community and fellowship this morning. This pastor said, I grew up on a farm in Indiana most of my life. For 11 years, we had, strawberry, we had a strawberry farm, and they were my favorite fruit. I once heard a powerful sermon, which I never forgot. The preacher said, I was on my hands and knees in my garden pulling weeds, when suddenly I noticed something I had seen hundreds of times, but realized it was a lesson. Got a picture for you here. How many of you know what these little red vines are that are running off of these plants? What did you say, Andy? Runners. Right? They call them runners on a strawberry plant. And there's other fruit plants as well that have these, but they're called runners. And what do these runners do? Well, from the main vine, the main berry plant, a number of these slender shoots extend like arms in all different directions. They are thin, green, or sometimes red stems that creep along the ground, being pushed out by that mysterious kind of mother plant that is in the middle of them. After reaching out about six inches or so, that end, that runner will usually go then back down into the ground and begin to develop a root system. Then the leaves of this new baby plant begin to shoot up out of the ground, all the while, before the infant plant is able to even sustain itself, it receives nourishment from the parent plant through that runner vine. When the new growth becomes fixed in the ground, the runner resumes its journey and it reaches out another six inches still nourishing that original plant that it put down, but multiplying one by one by one. It's repeated over and over again. There are several other runner vines that are doing the same thing off these berry plants in different directions. The preacher said, I forgot about all the weeds. I only saw the mother plant and all the runner vines that were running out from it and what was happening. Why do I share that story? Because much like this preacher talked about, for many, many years as he would be down on his hands and knees taking care of these strawberry plants, the thing that caught his attention was not the strawberry plants, not the runners, maybe not even the berries. It was the weeds. It was everything else that surrounded the strawberry plants that was getting his attention. How many times do we get caught up in the weeds of this world that we get distracted and we actually miss the beauty of what's taking place right in front of us. Because reality is there are weeds. There are things that are popping up all the time. 
that love to gather our attention and our time and our energy and our emotions. But sometimes we get stuck only seeing the weeds. We only see the brokenness, whether it's within the church or outside the church. But I want to encourage you this morning that we may learn to have eyes to see the incredible runners of faith who are made up of ordinary followers of Jesus, like you and I, simply desiring to make a difference in this world. Running the race God is calling us to run. Jesus taught his disciples about maintaining roots of faith. The key was staying connected to him each and every day. Which brings us to our third and final point this morning. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. Again, all three of these points this morning are not some profound, creative, unique idea that you've never heard before. Often for many of you, you've maybe heard these concepts over and over and over again, but I pray today it would be a reminder, an encouragement, and a challenge to you. But not long before Jesus was about to be crucified and buried in the tomb, he spoke these words of encouragement to his disciples and, and anyone else that may have been around at that time, because he knew that they were going to need to remain committed to their roots of faith, and that was the only hope that they were going to have of making an impact upon the world after his crucifixion and his resurrection. The same is true for each of us today as a church and as believers in Christ. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Remain in me and I in you. You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus used common imagery to help his disciples understand that we need to remain close to him. He talked about the vine and the branches which brought up the idea of a grape vineyard, because that's something that was very familiar to them in that day and age. And I've got a picture of a grape vineyard here, just for you to just kind of wrap your mind around this illustration that Jesus is using. It wouldn't be too hard for them to understand, and I believe even for us today, we understand the importance of a root system, or the importance of a main vine, a main tree trunk that provides for the rest of of a tree, a plant, a bush, a vine. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. So what does that mean? What does the vine provide? Well, the vine provides all of the energy, all of the resources, and the nutrients for each branch to thrive and produce. The trunk of a tree does the same for each branch as well. Jesus' example applies to us here today as well. He is the vine of our lives. He is the vine of your life. He is the vine of my life. He is the vine of our lives. We must be careful to stay connected to Jesus by submitting to his leadership, by spending intentional time in prayer, by studying his word, by listening to his Holy Spirit speak to us, by surrounding ourselves with people who will foster an environment that will help us to continue to grow in our spiritual walk with the Lord. This is why the church is so vital to us today. It's a community and it's fellowship in that, that we maintain a close relationship with God, that we maintain an encouraging relationship with one another. We can urge one another on to continue to walk forward in our faith despite the challenges we may be walking through. What good is a vineyard that only has a single grapevine? Not very effective. It's not going to produce a whole lot of fruit. But what good is a vineyard that is full of healthy vines? What good is a church that is full of healthy people connected to the vine that is Jesus and allowing that to produce fruit in our lives that not only impact our lives, but it impacts those in the world around us? A healthy vineyard is full of vines with healthy branches and healthy fruit in a plenty. The vine of Christ provides us, the branches, with all that we need to produce good fruit in our lives. There's a book called Becoming a Disciple by Daniel Borget that describes it in this way. 
This is an excerpt from his book talking about this illustration. The strong bond that unites the vine and the branches has to do with the sap that flows through them. Jesus does not use the word sap in the story. He talks about the vine and the branches. But nonetheless, it gives this lengthy idea of the love in a, in a way that's suggestive of sap and a vine. This is because he speaks of love flowing in one direction, from Christ towards his disciples, not in the reverse direction. Just as the sap flows from the vine into the branches and not the other way around, the whole picture is centered on the love that flows and gives life, like sap in a plant. The way of speaking about love invites the disciple to understand that we receive before we give, that we are not the origin of the love, and that we are loved before we've ever loved another. It's an invitation to learn about something the disciples often had trouble putting into practice. We must first allow ourselves to be loved by Christ before attempting to love on others. We must allow ourselves to be loved by Christ so that we can effectively show the love of God to others. And open ourselves up to Christ's love, just as a branch opens up to receive the sap, it also, as a result, produces fruit that brings about life. How easy this is for the branch, but how difficult it is for us. We have so much trouble accepting being loved by Christ, welcoming this love that Christ lavishes on us, and which gives us life. So I want to challenge you or with this thought today. When we open ourselves to the love and grace of God through our trust in Him, it empowers us to serve with compassion, grace, love, joy, mercy, and kindness. Without deep roots of faith and a constant connection to the source of love, we cannot produce spiritual fruit that is a blessing to the world. We will have everything necessary. We will have everything necessary when we are connected to the source of love and life. That is Jesus, the vine. Our deep roots of faith can have far-reaching effects. Because just as a berry bush has a runner, we too can have runners that multiply and multiply and multiply. For those of you today that are maybe questioning your faith or questioning who Jesus is, or maybe curious about a relationship with him, I want you to know this morning that you are welcome here unconditionally. There's no certain way that a person needs to dress. There's no certain way a person needs to act. I'm not asking you to give up everything in the world to be here with us. Did you know that when Jesus was on earth, some of his closest followers had the most checkered past? They were the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and the simple, uneducated fishermen. Jesus offers hope and salvation to people of every race and every background. Jesus loved the sick, the lonely, and the marginalized. You matter to God and you matter to us here at this church. We hope that you'll see this church as a place of refuge in the wilderness, as an anchor in the midst of the storm, as a place for you to belong that provides hope, help, and encouragement for whatever you are walking through. And we hope that you'll join us again, or if you're online, that you will consider joining us in person. But no matter who you are and where you come from, I'd like to close in praying this prayer over you this morning. Father, we thank you for this time today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement. Lord, we thank you that out of your love for us, you sent your Son. That he would live that perfect, sinless life. That he would become the sacrifice to forgive the sins of this world. That through his life, his death, and his resurrection, we could be forgiven of our sins. That we could receive salvation through acceptance of, our, of him as our Savior and repentance of our sin. And a desire to live for him all the days of our life. We thank you for your love, for your grace. We thank you for welcoming and reminding us of the importance of fellowship and community with one another and yourself. Lord, may you make us like the strawberries, reaching out like those runner vines, in an effort to multiply and bring forth good fruit 
in our lives, in this community, and across the world. Father, help us to continue to grow deep roots. Lord, help us that we may continue to experience a full life, and we may bless those who come into contact with us as we follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we just ask that you would be honored and glorified in our lives, that you would continue to empower, equip, and enable us to reach the lost around us for your honor and your glory. Father, forgive us when we fall short and empower us to have the courage to stand back up and to continue to move forward in the face of pressure and persecution. Lord, we thank you for who you are, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.